During the soporific 50s, access to both psychedelics and Buddhism was limited to a small but influential elite. A British psychiatrist working in Canada, Dr. Humphrey Osmond, enlisted Aldous Huxley as a subject for his experiments with mescaline in Los Angeles one afternoon in the middle of May 1953. Huxley was well prepared. He and his fellow expatriate, the writer Gerald Hurd, had studied Vedanta and practiced disciplined meditation for some years, and Huxley had ransacked the world's mystical writings for his anthology, The Perennial Philosophy. Sitting in his garden with Dr. Osmond, he experienced the grace and transfiguration he had read about. Remembering a koan from one of D.T. Suzuki's essays, quote, What is the Dharma body of the Buddha? He found the answer, the hedge at the bottom of the garden. He reported in The Doors of Perception, quote, At the same time, and no less obviously, it was these flowers. It was anything that I, or rather the blessed not I, released for a moment from my throttling embrace, cared to look at. Of course, Huxley still has famous wits about him. I'm not so foolish as to equate what happens under the influence of mescaline with the realization of the end and ultimate purpose of human life, enlightenment. He reassured his reader. All I am suggesting is that the mescaline experience is what the Catholic theologians call a gratuitous grace, not necessarily to salvation, but potentially helpful and to be accepted thankfully, if made available. When Maria, Huxley's wife of more than 30 years, lay dying of cancer, he read to her the reminders from the Tibetan Book of the Dead, reducing them to their simplest form and repeating them close to her ear. Let go, let go, go forward into the light. Let yourself be carried into the light. He continued after she had stopped breathing, tears streaming down his face with his quiet voice not breaking. A few years earlier, in July 1953, the ex-banker ethnomycologist Gordon Wasson and his wife, Valentina, had reached the Masatek village where they discovered the magic psilocybin mushrooms, the flesh of the gods, and managed to take part in an all-night veleda. Wasson's even-handed and respectful article on his adventures was published by Life in 1957. The article was read by a Berkeley psychologist, Frank Barron, who had tried some of the mushrooms, and passed on his enthusiasm to another academic psychologist and old friend, Timothy Leary. Before taking up his new job at Harvard Center for the Study of Personality, Leary spent the summer in Cuernacava, Mexico. Naturally, he tried the mushrooms. Quote, The journey lasted a little over four hours, he wrote. Like almost everyone who had the veil drawn, I came back a changed man. Leary was now more interested in transcendence than personality assessment. As head of the Harvard Psychedelic Drug Research Project, he ran a session for MIT professor Houston Smith, who made the experience available as a laboratory experiment for his seminars in mysticism. Next, in an now-famous double-blind experiment performed in 1962 on Good Friday in a chapel of the Boston University Cathedral, divinity students were given either psilocybin or a placebo. To no one's surprise, only those who had taken the psychedelic sacrament reported what appeared to be a bona fide mystical experience. Time published a favorable report, with reassuring quotes from Professor Walter Clark of Andover Smith and other leading theologians. Quote, we experienced that every priest, minister, rabbi, theologian, philosopher, scholar, and just plain God-seeking man, woman, and child in the country would follow up the implications of the study, wrote Leary. Instead, quote, a tide of disapproval greeted the good news. What followed was much worse. As use spread and the less expensive and much more powerful LSD became the drug of choice, all heaven and hell broke loose. Huxley, while guest lecturing at MIT in the 60s, advised discretion, keeping the drugs inside a small charmed circle, a kind of aristocratic mystery school. Leary put forth a plan for training and certifying guides. But it was all too much, too fast, and too late. A generation gap had blown open. The old were appalled, the young enthralled. Quote, Some students quit school and pilgrimaged eastward to study yoga on the Ganges. Leary wrote in flashbacks, Not necessarily a bad development from our point of view, 
but understandably upsetting to parents who did not send their kids to Harvard to become Buddhas. Leary and Alpert left Harvard in 1963. Now they were but one wave, albeit a very visible and noisy one in a counterculture transformation that was sweeping across America and about to crest in San Francisco. The center of activity was, of course, the High Ashbury District, which was just a short stroll from a Soto Zen mission. Sokoji and its American offshoot, the San Francisco Zen Center. But the spiritual atmosphere was more than Zen. It was eclectic, visionary, polytheistic, ecstatic, and defiantly devotional. The newspaper of the new vision, the San Francisco Oracle, exploded in a vast rainbow that encompassed everything in one great Whitmanesque blaze of light and camaraderie. North American Indians, Shiva, Kali, Buddha, Tarot, Astrology, St. Francis, Zen, and Tantra all combined to sell 50,000 copies on streets that were suddenly teeming with people. When the Oracle printed the Heart Sutra, it presented a double spread of the Zen Center version, complete with Chinese characters, but also with a naked goddess drawn in the best Avalon ballroom psychedelic. While the beats had dressed in existential black and blue, this new generation wore plumage, beads and feathers worthy of the most flaming tropical birds. If the previous generation had been gloomy atheists attracted to Zen by iconoclastic directives, quote, if you ever meet the Buddha, kill him, these new kids were, as Gary Snyder and Dom Graham in a 1967 interview in Kyoto, quote, unabashedly rebellious. They loved to talk about God or Christ or Vishnu or Shiva. Snyder himself had gotten a first-hand look at the counterculture when he returned from Japan for a short visit in 1966. He was just in time for the first be-in at Golden Gate Park, where he was joined by a number of friends from the early beat days. Allen Ginsberg was there, as were Lawrence Ferlinghetti and Michael McClure. Kerouac was conspicuous by his brooding absence. He wanted nothing to do with it at all. When Leary had offered him LSD back in Ginsburg's apartment in New York, he had objected. These new hippies horrified him. When a bunch of kids showed up at his mother's house in Northampton, Long Island, with jackets that said, Dharma Bums, across the back, he slammed the door in their faces. But now, at the BN, with the sun shining through a deep blue sky and thousands of people, at ease, in all their finery on the meadow, Snyder read his poems, and Ginsberg chanted the Heart Sutra to clear the meadows of lurking demons. Even Shunryu Suzuki Roshi of the burgeoning San Francisco Zen Center appeared briefly, holding a single flower. Also present on the stage that afternoon were Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, the two ex-Harvard psychology professors, who in three short years had become prophetic psychedelic Pied Pipers Whatever else LSD became in time, at that moment, it was the messenger that led a fair number of people into the dazzling land of their own mind. What had begun as the private discovery of a few intellectuals and experimenters had spread in a flash, and for a split second of history, it was as if everyone's veil had been rent and all the archetypes of the unconscious now sprang forth.